Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tim and welcome to Tim Talks, the show that's only partially a show, but really it's just an excuse for me to talk to some of my very talented friends. I have another one here with me today, he is the founder over at Punished Props and is the man who puts the master in Props Master, Bill Duran. Welcome sir. Hello, hello, happy to be here. Good, good. We're glad to have you, sir. So, uh, as you can tell by the vast variety of things he has behind him, Bill is what you would call a classic nerd. Sure, yeah. That, that in the and very has, sense of the word, I would say, yeah. And you have somehow figured out a way to take your love and passion for all things non-existent and turn it into a th job that you really love in making them existent. Yeah, and it's a journey that I am still learning how to do every single day. Taking taking your passion and turning it into a career is uh, it, it's I would probably guess a ten year process and I'm only a couple yeah. years deep. <laughs> and so for those who are unfamiliar with what you do, uh, give them basically give them your CV, give them a Reader's Digest version of what you do. I run a, my own company. It's a one man show currently, although sometimes my friends help out. Uh, I'm over here in Seattle and I build replica props and costumes for a living. Generally on a commission type basis, although my commissions are currently closed until 2015, uh, mm. people will come to me and say, hey, I want this from my favorite video game. Like, for example, the uh, M98 Widow sniper rifle from Mass Effect. And uh, we agree on a price and then I build it for them. Which is, and the, the Drene totem, the, uh, which was one of the first things. Oh, my goodness. That was a long that was a really long time ago. Um, yeah, I built the Drenai totem with lights in it. I built it to go on top of an LED uh, light bulb with a remote so you could change the colors on it. Oh, wow. That was a very long... I would I would do that one very differently now, now that I think about how... <laughs> um, yeah, lots of stuff like that. And, uh, and that's generally how I make my living. I also do a lot of uh, content on the old internet, doing uh, live shows and videos and, and how-to guides and ebooks and all that wonderful stuff. So uh, you're obviously older than 10 years old. Yes. Uh, so how did you then get into that company? Uh, you didn't start out doing that, I take it. No, and to, up until uh, two, two and a half years ago, I was working in good old corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> Had a real job, yeah, as they say. One of those careers. God, those are the worst. Yeah, it, the, the, uh, the steady paycheck was nothing to balk at, though. That was pretty good. Of course. I mean, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Let's not, you know, take that for granted. The steadiness of the paycheck is always wonderful. But as we talked about, getting to combine your passion and your career, yeah, it, that blows it away every time. So I did. I worked at uh, this company. You've probably heard of them. They're called Microsoft. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a little upstart company, yeah, I they're, hear. Uh, they're making big waves out here in Seattle. <laughs> I worked there for like four years, and it was a decent job, and it paid for it pretty well. And I was on the path to becoming a career Microsoft person. But uh, then I was like, I sure love making stuff in my basement. Why don't I do that instead? So I quit my day job. I started my own company, and now... I do this every day, and I don't regret it. Not one. The rest, as they say. Yep, it's history. Yeah. You got to love it, though. That's the funny part. When people go back and tell the story of accomplishment, they usually go, and then some things happened, and then I was successful. They kind of gloss over the fact that you you kind of have to break eggs yeah. to make an omelet. I mean, that's an expression for a reason. Or instead of breaking eggs, uh, go into massive credit card debt. <laughs> yes, yes, I, the starving artist. I, that, you know, that's also an expression, and I am one of them. I mean, sometimes you have to go through the dregs before you finally hit a point where people recognize talent when, it's, when it shows its ugly head. It's, uh, it's tricky, too, because you can, you can start – not even a career, but just get your name out there online and have a ton of recognition and do a lot of really good work and still have absolutely no idea how to turn that into income. And that is yes. the, real, the real method that I'm still, like I said, still learning every single day, making that better and work for me. <laughs> but you've been able to uh, get some excellent commissions as well. Like uh, from Blizzard, you got to make the Kerrigan's Ghost Rifle. Oh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, in fact, funny story about that rifle. Um, a buddy of mine who's a prop maker in Hollywood, his name is Ted Smith. He goes by Evil mm -hmm. Ted Smith. I built one of those rifles, and I brought it with me to go to Blizzard HQ at, at BlizzCon. And uh, I was at my friend's house, and Ted showed up, and he saw the rifle I had made. And, and he was like, oh, I made one of those. I was like, what? What are you talking about? 
But a number of years ago for BlizzCon, they built the Nova statue, and uh -huh. he got and commissioned to make the rifle for it. The same exact gun. So I was like, because it would be issued. It wouldn't be like a custom for Kerrigan. Yeah, it was so cool. So I was like, high five, man. So I got a photo of me that's, when I went to Blizz HQ holding my rifle in front of the one that Ted made. And that was really neat. That's really awesome. That was so cool. <laughs> I mean, what other kind of... Have you gotten any other big commissions? My most recent one was, another again, another little local company. Maybe you've heard of them called Wizards of the Coast. Uh -huh. make, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I believe, is what it's called. Yeah. And, and, and Magic. Magic the uh, Cuthering, the... yeah. Yeah. Wow. I think it has something to do with Highlander. Mm. Wow. Uh, anyway, they uh, they have a game called Kaijudo, and it's mm -hmm. another card game. I think it's targeted towards a younger audience, kind of like Magic the Gathering, although pretty young people play Magic as well. Um, they wanted me to build a trophy for them for their new tournament. They just had a tournament a couple weeks ago. But, oh, right, yes. So there was this gauntlet from the lore that's like this really cool, gnarly-looking gauntlet thing, and they came to me because I build costumes, and they wanted something that someone could wear. So not only excuse me, not only is it a trophy, but it was a wearable gauntlet. So um, hmm. that was probably my biggest commission to date. It was really fun, a lot of hard work, and it turned out awesome, and they loved it. So, yay. So then that segues well into the fact that you have your own YouTube channel where you're able to make videos about some of the things that you create that is correct how did you combine those two loves i've been shooting and editing video since high school um just oh, funsies yeah. you know making little music videos with my friends in fact i gotta go find some of those and put those up because they're really dumb but, uh, <laughs> um yeah a lot of it was just my commissions fill up instantly because i'm a one dude show and i get you know dozens of commissions every single every single day uh, right. So I can't make stuff for everyone. I can't. I would love to be able to build something for everyone that asks, but I just don't have the time. And even though I tell my cats, get to work, start sanding that. They just. It just. You don't have the flute. Yeah. You need that Pied Piper flute. Those jerks. Those lazy jerks. But uh, so I started making videos and doing publishing how tos and stuff to say, hey, look, I can't make everything for you, but I'll show you how I made what I made, and then you can possibly you know work on it yourself. And that turned into something really, really satisfying because now I'm getting, I'm lowering the barrier to entry to the craft. A lot of people right. will say, oh, I could never do that. It looks so tricky. I'm like, look, just start small and work your way up like I did. And, and people, the, the, the world is opening up to them like, oh, my goodness, I gave it a try and it wasn't that bad. And like when, when people realize that it's basically particle board and polystyrene yeah. glued together, they're like, oh, oh wow, that's, <clears throat> that's actually. I have some of that. Yeah, that is that is mortal level skill. Yeah. That's that doesn't take some sort of talent from on high. Yeah, so, I mean to be fair, to make it look amazing yeah. takes talent from on high. Let's not or you know brush that under the rug. A lot but of you time. can make something workable. A lot of time and a lot of trial and error. Yes, yes. What's one prop that you've been working on for a while? Just random question that got on my head that has eluded you something that you've tried making for so long that you just can't quite get right that's tricky um i since most of the the work i do is on commission basis and it has a deadline it just it has to get done um, right. and and i will like uh the gauntlet went really well that's that's an example of for some reason everything went according to plan uh which is rare by the way yeah the, uh, the kerrigan rifle though that was one that was it took a lot longer i had i made a lot of mistakes it was a very emotionally charged build um i was building the molds for that i had some mold bo mold boxes fail i had silicone leak everywhere oh, wow. it was just really really tough and fortunately i'm like the the men in my family are extremely stubborn and i and i inherited that gene so it's really for me just a, a matter of like i'm not i'm not stopping I'm going to keep doing this and this stubbornness. Until you figure out a way to make it yeah, work. Yeah, or just strong arm my way through the process and eventually finish something that looks decent. Right. Well, I don't have any specific projects that have, that, have, uh, that have conquered me, not yet at least. Maybe that means Good. I need to challenge myself more. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, some of those look pretty freaking awesome. The stuff from Wildstar that you did oh, for uh, Jessica Negri and, and uh, the other cosplay people. Yeah. That was fun. I'm I've been playing Wildstar, and I really want to make lots more stuff from that game. So that was my chance to both build something for my friends and get something in front of the Wildstar devs and be like, "Hey, look! I would love to make more stuff from your game." Eh. 
I'm just saying you got neat stuff that would be really cool to make. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, so how did uh, you say that you've been working on video editing for quite a long time. You have just the, the show where you teach people how to make props. You also have a show where you talk to other props maker people and cosplay people called uh, Prop Live. Yeah, I do. Um, that was sort of my dip into the whole episodic live show thing. And it started off just me sitting in front of a camera answering people's questions, uh, just general prop and costume making questions. But then I was like, I got to get my friends in on this. Uh, and that turned into a really great way to both promote my friends, have them help promote my show, and get another opinion with for all these questions and stuff. I mean, that's such a great idea. Who would ever think to do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I love doing things like this. Uh, you're right. This sort of one-on-one -on -one format is excellent mm -hmm. for just figuring out things and getting a discussion going and, and delving into the hows and the whys behind the whats. Yeah. You know, people can look all day and see what you built, but how you got around to getting the ideas, taking the concept of something that didn't exist and putting it in a tangible form, that is a very interesting process oh, okay. every time. And it's going to be different every time yeah and that's one of the other reasons why i love having my friends on is i'll give you an example painting right just picking up mm -hmm. a blank prop and painting it every single prop maker that i know has a totally different process just uh, yeah. completely and no one process is right or wrong it's but it's great to get that another opinion and you know my friend svetlana put out a book recently about painting I went through it, and I was like, wow, that is totally different than the way I do it. And it looks incredible, and I want to steal some of those little ideas and nuggets and incorporate that into how I do my stuff. I, I feel like that is how you come up with your own style. Right. You know, people ask, how do you, how do you make something that's your own, that's unique, that's blah, blah, blah. You take all the things that you love, and you smash them in together into one giant ball. You add little Tim flavorings, and suddenly you've got your own unique style. Yeah, and that's really how it, how it all comes together. Um, and the other thing, too, though, of course, having my friends on my show, a lot of us, um, especially those of us who do this sort of thing for a living, will uh, we don't see each other. We don't talk to each other. We kind of spend most of our time in our own worlds. Yeah. So that was kind yeah. of my greedy attempt to get to have a conversation with some of my friends from around the world and country. And it that's true. Out. I imagine that would be very difficult. Back in uh, back in graduate school, there was a big uh, event every year around Easter for all of the uh, fight directors, for the Society of American Fight Directors, okay. who come down to Louisiana Tech, and they have this big workshop over the weekend, and then a crawfish boil after that, where they all get to hang out for a while, and this is like the one time of year that all of these people are not so busy that they can't just catch up with their friends. Right. You know, and, and I feel like that's very important because you do get to trade secrets and you get to trade techniques and everybody yeah. has a little bit too much to drink and starts sword fighting in the backyard. <laughs> that I, I, I can only imagine how that would be for, for people who make amazing things as well. That, that does sound an awful lot like Dragon Con to me. <laughs> Although in years, uh, the last couple of years, though, it's getting harder and harder. Um, a lot of my friends, too, um, my friend Harrison, for example, from Vulpin Props, he's a local to Atlanta, and he's kind of like a local celebrity. So he goes to Dragon Con, and he gets mobbed by people, and it's hard to have a conversation with him, even though I'm there. And I'm like, I kind of want to chat with my buddy. Uh, so it's having another place where I can just sit down and have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with some of my pals it's nice because we all end up getting trapped in our own tiny little worlds and don't really know what's yeah. going on in each other's lives. So it's, yeah. it's nice to have that. You get, I mean, and, and that's a little bit more literal than you would like. I mean, that workshop kind of encompasses the only thing you see for a certain period of time when you when the project is demanding. Of oh it. yeah, some the, I've had days too where it's um, before Dragon Con last year. So my my, my wife has a job. Uh, she works at Bungie, working on Destiny, so they're they're oh, wow. really busy doing that. So she'll yeah. be she'll be gone before I wake up, and she'll get back, you know, at dinner time. I'll have days where I wake up, work out, go to the shop until it's time to go to sleep, and I just see the inside of my shop all day, and I feel very isolated. Um, yeah. So having an excuse to to break out of that on a weekly basis is pretty nice. <laughs> So then are, you're going to Dragon Con this year. Is there anything that you're building for it? 
Um, I have that you can talk about. Uh, well, it's not that I don't want to make any promises because I'm really short on time for some reason this year. I've just been really bad about my time management, or I should say, I've promised a lot. I've overbooked myself. <laughs> That's really mm-hmm. what it is. So I'm going to be jamming on commissions for the next couple of months to get those done in time. And I don't because really that's know. uh what the last weekend in August. Yeah, yeah, it sure. Is. I'm like, uh, how many days is that? Uh-huh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to depress you with that. I, I'm just trying to get a timeline <laughs> in my head. Time. <laughs> so I don't know what I what I'll be able to get finished for myself. Which is the sad irony of my life is that I build all this stuff for other people and then I run out of time to build something for myself. But I do yeah, have some ideas. Course. I do have some ideas. Um, I will bring my my Skyrim armor this year, my wife and I, and I'm gonna we're gonna augment them a little bit, just in, you know, touch them up and, and the Draugr, yeah, Death the Lord Death Lords. We did some uh, some undead, creepy skeleton costumes, so we'll bring those again. And those were a big hit last year, so they should be fine. Excellent. And then uh, I remember you ran in kind of to a similar problem with the Iron Man Mark Forty Two armor. Yeah, that was that was dumb of me i was like oh, i'll make totally make this in a week for san diego comic-con and i got oh oh ooh. yeah i got an arm and a leg done and i was like what was that thing that was stupid i think i put up a video of me at like midnight one night i'm like guys i can't i can't do this to be fair you could be the tony stark where he's running around with just the arm and the leg on which and is what i all that's exactly what i ended up doing i got like a hoodie and i got an arm and a leg and at San Diego Comic Con, people would go, "Hey, where, where's the rest of the suit?" And I was like, "Oh, it's on, it's it's on its way. It's fine. It's flying through the air. excellent." And some people got excellent. the joke, and some people didn't. And I was like, "Did you even see Iron Man three? Come on!" <laughs> but anyway, that suit I I gave to my brother, and he ended up finishing it. So, and now he's totally rebuilding it from scratch. So, so your on. brother builds yes props too. Yeah, my uh, he's well, he's a science teacher, a high school science teacher, but. Uh, oh, really? uh, we got him and his wife in on this uh, this whole cosplay thing, so they're on board. Um, That's fantastic. It's always nice when you can have family bonding over a shared experience. Oh yes. In this case, making amazing things. Yep. Or making that they'll they obviously use my shop. They come in, use all my tools and all the space. And uh, and by the way, my brother is I my identical twin brother. We look exactly the same. So, really? Yeah, so we're, we're planning maybe on doing some twin-themed costumes here coming up. We'll see what we can do there. I was going to say, I mean, that could be very, very fun antics. You know, you go in one way, and then he comes yep. out another place somewhere else. Or Clark Kent jumps behind a pillar, and Superman instantly jumps out the other side. Now that yeah. is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I like the way you think. Oh, yeah. Uh, so then, um, how do you... Tell us about like making the workshop because that requires collecting a lot of different tools over a long period of time and kind of figuring out what you're going to need in advance. Uh, no, not in advance at all. It's totally just whatever I need at the time, I'll run out and get. Mm-hmm. And before I built up a lot of my workshop before I quit my day job, so when I had disposable income, I would be like, Well, I need a belt sander, so let's get that, or I need this, or I need that, um, right. or by the way, folks, if you're getting married, just register at Sears. Hmm? Then you can both get like flatware and dishes and all that crap and power tools. Like you can register both things. So that's how I got my my craftsman rotary tool. That's how I got my jigsaw. That's how I got my chop saw. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Register at Sears, everyone, when you get married. Um, then you can get all your power tools. So I did that too, all of that way before I, I quit my day job. Um, and now it's it's finish a commission, get my paycheck, invest a tiny bit of that into new tools. So for example, right. I, I finished my big commission for Wizards of the Coast and I was able to set aside some of that money and go buy an absolutely gigantic drill press. It's like five and a half feet tall. It's awesome. Wow. Yeah, so I can actually put my old drill press in that and drill a hole right through it. Because it's that big. <laughs> Jeez, that is a large drill press, sir. Yeah, I am through messing around with gnarly little tools. It's time for the big guns. <laughs> um, so then you do a lot of work uh, you, in some of the videos that you show, especially that Gauntlet video. It kind of shows off you using uh, Maya, the yep. Autodesk software yep. Maya, to kind of build the prototypes and all that stuff. How did you go about learning how to do that? Four years of college. That's what I did. Oh. Yeah. I went to school to be a 3D modeler and an animator. Really? Yep. I got a degree in uh, 3D computer art. I did a lot of video compositing, video editing. I did a lot of uh, Photoshop work, Illustrator. 
and tons and tons of Maya 3D modeling. That explains the YouTube channel, uh, and I think you might have uh, brushed over that earlier. Mm -hmm. So I um, um, I did. Oh, sorry, my phone's yelling at me. Um, <laughs> so I did that. I was gonna. I wanted to work for video games, building 3D models and stuff. Um, but I just never really had the passion for it. I never followed through with it. Uh, but building real things, which is very similar, only in a real space, that... Only you actually have something physical yeah. to touch when you're done. And you're like, this is amazing. I, that was, yeah. that was the thing that set it off for me. And I was like, ah, this I can do. And I, I, right. I decided that when I, when I was willing to not play World of Warcraft so that I could build props, that I knew that I had the passion for it. Uh, because I, at the time, when I was trying to be a 3D modeler, I spent a lot more of my time playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> of course, of course. The giant time sink that everyone falls into. Yep, yep. Um, but then, now you're able to take stuff from that game and make it. Yeah, which I have. Where once, where once there was nothing, now there is something. And that is... It's almost almost the opposite of being a 3D modeler, where I'm taking a digital thing and turning it into a real thing. Right. So actually, a, while, uh, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, I made um, the Warglave of Azanoth that Illidan has, the big Warglave. That was fun. Oh, wow. I kind of wish I could get that one back. <laughs> <laughs> have you thought about doing any uh, CNC things? Yeah. Or have you ever done? Um, I've only done, I've done laser cutting type stuff. Anything that's 2D plotting type stuff, I'm pretty good at that. As far as CNC stuff, I do actually have a background in CAD, but that's that was 15 years ago. And uh, if I were to brush up on my skills there, then I would be very interested in doing uh, CNC like milling or like five axis milling or more 3D yeah. type stuff. I just need to find the time to brush up on those skills. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, that's what my roommate is studying, oh, uh, draft and design. And so he's now going through like Inventor yep. and programs like that where he's able to – like he was working on a, a 3D model of a TARDIS just the other day. Thank and I was you. having to – uh, I was using After Effects and how you can like create a light and move it around and do shadows and things of that nature to kind of explain how lights create shadow in different ways, which I know from film. Right, right. You know, and and but After Effects has this amazing thing where you can just take a light and position it around an object and show okay when it's coming when the light from the TARDIS is shining from the top of the box it's going to create a down shadow and a radial this way, this way, yeah. this, you know, and I was able to actually physically show him things like that. And now he can visualize it easier going into the program. Oh yeah. There you go. It's cool stuff. And so it's, yeah, it's always really neat when you can take those extra knowledges and just funnel them all into one project, which I imagine you do all the time. Yeah. Every single project I work on is some form of mixed media, either doing 3d stuff, even if the 3d stuff is just to use as a reference or to throw it into something like Peppercore Designer and lay out a flattened uh, sort of diagram of it that you can cut up and assemble. Or um, uh, 3D, like I have done a little bit of 3D printing, very, very uh, non-technical stuff. I'll th build it in Maya, and I built like a little space gun, like had it printed keychain size, teeny tiny space gun. <laughs> Which was really neat. I got that. I was like, "Hey, you make this." I modeled it and sent it to Shapeways, and sure enough, a little box, tiny little box, showed up with these tiny little space guns in it. It was really satisfying. <laughs> that I mean, it is really neat to see some of the stuff that three D printing is able to come out with once you get them of decent size, you know, and are able to actually make some bigger things. That's going to be really, really awesome. Like they're able to take that. That Swedish invention that's like the spider leg yeah. that moves sideways. Have you seen like that thing? Wonder Beast or whatever they call it. Strong yeah, beast. and you're able to literally 3D print that yeah. in working form. Yeah, it's done. I it mean, pops out assembled. That's crazy. That's insane. Yeah. So so I love, I love that stuff like that is going to come along and kind of change the way we go about doing things like that. You're not going to have to run out to the store for uh, to buy the plastic mold to put onto the... Um, thing for the gauntlet and and make those off you're going to be able to just scan that little seal and 3d print it yeah yeah someday that'll be there actually um for, depending on what you're doing too something as I, I mean laser cutters and engravers have been around a long time and and that's that's next on my list of big things i'm going to buy is a big old laser cutter 
Uh, and, nice. and just that alone is just like, hey, what if I could make perfect cuts instantly? Oh, wow, a laser cutter can do that. Oh, all right, let's get one of those. It's interesting to note how every small advancement in different things, like um, you did a couple of videos on like your favorite kinds of super glue, and then you did it on Bondo, mm -hmm. and you did it on all these things that you might not have had the expertise to know that these are the best things when you started, but in doing the process, you learn, oh, these are the best materials, right. and I should tell people that these are the best materials. Ben Nye is the best makeup, you know, uh, uh, things of that nature. And so sharing some of the things that you learned, that's interesting. How do you like go about finding those best materials. I just, I, I'll tell you what, when I hear someone talking about a, a material that they would say is like a wonder material, for example, mm -hmm. Warbler, uh, lots and lots of people love their thermoplastics like Warbler or Wonderflex. So I ran out and got some and I just played with it. Or I would say, um, maybe it would work for this project and I give it a try. And if it works or if it doesn't work, then I'll know going forward to whether or not to do that again. <laughs> So, for right. example, my wife made some horns for our Death Lords, and she wrapped Warbler around them to look like ridged horns, like an animal horn. And that for that application, it worked fantastic. So now, going forward, I can say, hey, if I'm going to make horns, I'll just do it like that. And I can tell everyone else that, and they don't have to spend as much time in the trial and error process as I have. Go through the pain and heartache that comes with that. And the expense. Let's not forget, Warbler ain't cheap. Right. You are absolutely correct, sir. I'm finally getting around to this area myself because uh, I've been working on a couple of sets recently where they've hired me to do like art department stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's been really fun to make props on the fly yeah. and, and kind of have to do uh, sideways problem solving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that, that is really fun for me. That, uh, the, the problem solving aspect of building, like building something from a video game that's in no way real. And when they, when they designed it, they didn't expect it to be real. So they'll make decisions yeah. that make very little sense in the real world. The problem-solving aspect of turning that into a real thing is a very satisfying, difficult, and challenging uh, process. But I, I do. I love it. I enjoy it. There's nothing like that satisfaction of knowing that you are faced with an impossible task. And somehow, here it is. Yep. Hey, look it's at that finished. thing. Look at that thing I made. And it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm able to hold it in my hands. It's not just off in the ether yeah. somewhere. Or taking something that, that was spawned just in your brain, like just an, an idea that you thought of or a combination of ideas, and then like a week later you're like, huh, look at that. It's right there on my desk. That was in my brain, you, and now it's right there. Do you have a favorite baby? Um, it's it. I like that you put it that way because picking a favorite project is a lot like picking a favorite child. Oh, yeah. No, it really is. It, I, I understand completely. Um, usually, I'll be an artist and say, well, my favorite is whichever the last one is I did. Because, the, obviously, that's the best one. And, yeah. and the rest of them are trash. Uh, um, well, I mean, you're right. You are The work you do is accumulation of the experience you've had at the time. So, hopefully, the most recent one is the best you've done so far. Right, right. That That's the, always the goal. That is the goal. I'll say today, though... I made a dagger from Skyrim called Keening, and uh, no one else has done that one before, as far as I know, with like a real see-through gem thing. I'm pretty, oh, pretty wow. happy with how that one turned out. I'll bet. Yeah. I already bet. And, and so uh, you do a lot of stuff for yourself for conventions and things of that nature. What are some of the other things that you've done for other people? Uh, let's kind of go run down a list real quick. Um, I'll, let's look at my website here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do that, too. And... Uh, Plugs will come at the end of the show I, as well. So you you mentioned the the Wild Star Blades. I did that, and I did a rifle and sword from an old anime called Nausicaa. That's mm -hmm. a, another one I did for my friend Jessica Negri. Uh, I did a Borderlands plasma caster last year for Dragon Con for someone, and that one I was really really happy with how that one turned out. It had, oh wow! It's got glowing lights on it. Lights are always a crowd pleaser, so that's a fun one to put together. Um, a Halo Four sniper rifle that was really cool. Um, I would love to do more. I would love to do something else from Halo. That'd be kind of mm -hmm. fun. See what they they announced a new one, I believe. So we'll see what. Yeah, uh, Guardians. Something like that. I don't remember. Halo Five. I I I, I, uh, I yeah. I you know listen. I blame Halo as the downfall of the first person shooter genre. Yeah. So after like three and I, I liked Reach, but I I still haven't played Halo Four. 
and my interest is waning rapidly. Oh, yeah. Especially since I've turned more recently to, like, PC gaming. Yeah, I'm a PC gamer myself, so I've sort of... If the Halo games came out on PC, I would love to play them, which makes no sense why they're not. They're definitely owned by Microsoft. Oh, yeah, yeah. So please bring them to Windows and not games for Windows Live. Fortunately, though, there are plenty of other games that are good and on PC yeah. that are keeping me busy, so... Exactly. Uh, speaking of, I noticed that you also sell kits uh, on your website. Yeah, for a long time, that's, that's kind of my bread and butter. Um, what I'll do is I'll build, let's say, a, uh, a gun from Mass Effect. Because, mm -hmm. I don't know, I've turned into the Mass Effect gun guy, which I'm okay with, because I love Mass Effect. And uh, yeah. I'll build it, and for example, the um, the Carnifex, the sort of standard issue sidearm that Commander Shepard uses. Uh, I had a commission to build that, and then I had someone else say, hey, I want one too. And I was like, all right, I'll make a mold of that so that I can make copies. You know, mold making, make it's a lot longer process. Um, the expense, silicone's expensive. But if I can sell extras, then it makes it worth it. Because right. I'll take a week to build the master, and I'll make the mold, and then I can pop out copies much, much quicker after that. So I'll have these molds that I made, and I'll sell a blank kit which means it's just plastic resin, unpainted. Uh, but the, the, the big uh, advantage is it's way cheaper than buying like a finished painted gun from me. Cause it, of course. Uh, to cast a copy might take an hour, whereas painting it might take 10. So, yeah, and so you're not having to pay for the time and labor, right. and also you get to do the, the bulk of the hard work is left undone. Right. I mean, the painting, let's face it, that the detail work is the right. hardest part. But it's the, but you've taken away the material. Yeah, aspect. but it's the area that allows for a lot more artistry, a lot more of your own yeah. interpretation, your own skill, exactly. your own ideas. You could custom paint it however you want. So I've gotten a lot of really great feedback, people wanting kits or buying kits, and then, then painting it themselves and putting their own spin on it, which is really neat. I saw that one of them you have on there right now is the uh, Handsome Jack mask. Yeah, yeah, that thing is, it's really, um, that was a good one. That was a lot of fun. I uh, originally, again, originally someone commissioned me to build one of those. And I was like, I bet if I made a mold, I could sell a couple more of these. So I made a mold of that. And sure enough. I, Who out there yeah. would want to have the face of Handsome Jack? Yeah, he's a good looking fella. So, right. So yeah, I did that one. And people, uh, and again, it's just. Way easier. I'll pop out one of those and mail it off, and people will paint it up themselves. Is there one? Is there a challenge left unclimbed? Is there something that you want to do that you just haven't been asked to do yet? Oh, I have a whole list of those actually. Uh, what I, I and I copy. I unabashedly copy my friend's ideas. So my friend Harrison put an album on his Facebook page. That's all stuff that he would that he wants to make. But no one has asked him to make yet. And, and basically, he's like, hey, if you want to get to the head of the list, ask me to make one of these. Uh, so I see. Mine has a lot of revolvers on it. I don't know. I just really like revolvers, like a revolver from Borderlands, those big, chunky-looking things. But uh, I've also got some more stuff from Skyrim, because I love Skyrim. Uh, the glass mace would be cool. The glass stuff is a real cool challenge, because you've got to make a good, durable material that's also transparent. Right. What else is on here? Um, oh, man, the old, hey. old, talk about first-person shooters, the old Unreal Tournament flat cannon. Oh, Big, that like would be bit. bitching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. No, I love stuff like that because it's, like, it's, it's a reversed Amazon wish list. It's like, listen, yeah. you can buy these things for yeah. me. I just wanna. I just wanna make them. Yeah, I just wanna make them. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, we've got some Halo stuff on here. This is the battle rifle. I just that's the, my favorite type of this sort of assault rifle gun. That's my favorite type to use. A couple more here. The Halo Four Promethean weapons, the really alien-looking ones. Those would be kind of cool and a challenge because they've got lights on them and they have bits right. that are floating. You know, I'd have to figure that. That is very true. Yeah. I the the challenges that you face going into a unique build like that is there a process that you go through to kind of plot those things out um yeah well i do i draw blueprints of all of my projects so i'll draw a two-dimensional mm -hmm. blueprint and part of that process is a going through and finding all of the reference images that i can get and if i can get a 3d model like ripped from a game or stick oh yeah 3D model that is probably the best way that I can do it because then you can get a good isometric like flat uh, or not isometric, orthographic 
view of something, then awesome. Because I can take measurements straight from that if there's no perspective. Um, of and then B, actually drawing the blueprint, that process is like a mind game, a mind exercise in building the whole thing. So I'll take, let's say, 10 hours to draw out a blueprint. I just recently did that sniper rifle from Mass Effect. During the whole process, I'm making mental notes or actually writing down notes, uh, like, hmm, it's like figuring out how it's going to go together. Like, right. oh, this tube here, that's an inch and a half wide. Well, obviously, I'm going to go buy an inch and a half diameter PVC pipe. Boom, the barrel's done. Hooray. You have to build the chair in your head before you actually can build the yep, chair. Yeah, and that's exactly it. So um, when I'm drawing out that blueprint is when I'm, by the time I'm done drawing the blueprint, I've already built the whole thing in my head. Um, and then sometimes there are different parts. I'll be like, I'm not quite sure about this part, but I have a couple ideas. So I'll try those out and see what mm -hmm. works best. Hmm. Yeah. So it's definitely a process where you sit down and plot everything out before. A lot of uh, planning beforehand can save you a lot of oh, heartache yes. during the process. Yes, definitely. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. The, the better you mm -hmm. get at that process, that planning process. Um, and when you learn, you may plan something ahead of time and think, that's a great idea. And then <laughs> it, and, and in theory, it is. In practice, not so much. So next time you're like, this sounds like it. Wait, last time I thought that would work, but it totally didn't. So that process evolves and improves over time. Excellent. As well, it should. I'm excited to see all the cosplay. We got a big event coming up here in Austin next week. Uh, RTX, which is Rooster Teeth's big oh, convention. Oh, wow. Cool. And um, there should be a lot of big cosplay coming in for that. Not only just your normal cavalcade stuff, but halo and ruby centric stuff as well there are people who bring in uh these giant scythe weapons which is the main weapon of the main character are you familiar at all uh with their stuff with ruby yeah um i have had people send me i haven't watched it yet but i have had people send me like commission requests about that i haven't built any yet but I, wow but i am the, i think i know the giant scythe. it's r that is that is purveyance R yeah rwby is the name of it uh and that's the, their anime series that they do that's kind of taken off yeah. and is um, the premiering season two at this oh, event, wow. I believe. Um, so, and yeah, this giant scythe here I'm seeing. I've seen, People have sent this to me before, but I have not yet had the chance to make it. That is social purveyance. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. Uh, so I'll be interested to see all the stuff that's coming out for this. And, and I mean, just the costumes that are coming out of it and... The weapons are always going to be awesome. It's neat to see a thing, as we said in the very beginning of this video, that only existed in the ether, mm -hmm. and now here it is. I love talking, when I get a chance, talking to developers. Uh, for example, um, when we went, we flew back from uh, Dragon Con last year on the Monday, and even though PAX and Dragon Con overlap, PAX was still going on that Monday, so we, we begged for someone to get some Monday badges. We threw our Skyrim costumes back on, and we went to PAX, even though we were jet-lagged and tired and exhausted. So the first thing we did in there, we're like, we're, we have to go to the Elder Scrolls booth because we have Elder Scrolls costumes. So we scurried over yeah. there, and the, the developers that were there lost their minds. They were like, oh, it's so cool! Because it's got to be feel so good if you're a developer to build this thing and then see people create it in the real world and show up wearing it. It's got to oh, be pretty yeah. cool. Oh, yeah. No, that's got to be... If flattery is the ultimate form of compliment, yeah. then that has to be that times 100. Yeah, I can only imagine. So, um, so yeah, that the, uh, the folks at Bioware are awesome. They do a great job recognizing their cosplay community, um, especially at Dragon Con. They'll have groups. Like, we did a, a Mass Effect meetup with photo shoot and there were like 60 people dressed up in mass effect costumes it was a wow yeah and wow they'll send a couple of developers there too just to, they just like hang out they just hang out at the bar and have a good time and they'll do a panel or two and and they like one guy the um the drag i was there for a dragon age photo shoot and the one of the the writers the guy the main guy david uh gator who does the writing for for dragon age he was there, oh, yeah. and he's, like, getting all choked up. He's like, you guys are so cool. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, let's all hug and have a good time. <laughs> well, I feel like that's a very good note to start rounding out the show. Uh, and uh, as I always do, I 
want to uh, end this session with a series of questions inspired by Inside the Actor Studio. Right. So I, too, have a reappropriated version of the Proust personality questionnaire, and it goes a little something like this. Bill, what's your favorite word? My favorite word? I, I would probably – I like silly words. Uh, so the word dongle is pretty good. I like dongle. That is a very excellent yeah. word. I don't have a lot of occasion to use it, <laughs> but when I do, it is, it is pretty sweet. What's your least favorite word? Mm. Mm. Can't is a pretty bad one. I don't like mm -hmm. that. Um, I don't like neg negativity. So that, yeah, let's go with can't. Most of the Fair time enough. when people say they can't do something, they really mean they won't do something. Yeah. What sound or noise do you love? Oh, boy. Uh, it's hard to beat. Hmm. Hard to beat a good, heavily distorted guitar. Yeah, like a Marshall. I have a Marshall 50 watt amp. Plug a uh, um, plug a, a Gibson SG into that. Just fire off some power chords. It's pretty oh, man. There. oh man! Oh really man! Loud. It hits you with that vibration straight yeah. from the speaker. Because you got you got it. The problem with a 50 watt amp is I live in I have neighbors, so I can't turn it all the way up. But it sounds really good when you turn it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to go to 11, man. That's why they put it on there. What sound or noise do you hate? Oh, uh, the sound of a breaking scroll saw blade. Oh. Yeah, that will make you poop right in your pants. That sounds way too exacting to be just made up off the top of your head. It's the, one of those <laughs> things that happens frequently enough. Um, that it's a thing, but not so infrequently that I'm ever going to get used to it. But it happens, right. and you crap your pants. What uh, what hero or heroine do you identify with the most? Um, I don't know about identify with, but I don't know. I like Wolverine an awful lot. I like the kind of anti-hero thing. And also, he's a short guy, a short, hairy dude, and uh, and I can get behind that. <laughs> So then on the converse end of that spectrum, what favorite villain or villainess? Hmm. Bad guys. The bad guys are the, the ones that you like the most, the ones I like the most, the ones that you'd love to hate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love, uh, I think Voss is oh, the one being yeah. called out now as one of the better really written too, villains. Right. And this, it's going to be kind of cliche, but like, uh, like Cersei Lannister from, from the Song of Ice, Ice and Fire series. It's hard to love to hate someone as much as I love to hate her. <laughs> so what would be your superpower? Mm. If I had to pick one, it would definitely be a healing factor because mm -hmm. I hurt myself constantly. And that would be, really, that would be pretty <laughs> handy. That's just freaking practical. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing there's nothing egotistical oh. about that one. I just hate getting hurt. No, and, and, and some people are like, I would love to fly. I'm like, no, because... Like, if you're flying up there, like, a Yahoo with a 22 could take you down. Like, No, yeah, it, yeah. Excellent oh, point. healing factor for this guy. What would be your super weakness? Hmm. Ah, uh, boy. I don't, hmm. Maybe puppies would be my kryptonite. I love puppies. Yeah. It would be a distraction. And, I man, I want a dog so bad. My cats are dumb. I want <laughs> I would get a lot less work done though if I had a dog. I'd be like, "You want to go outside and play, boy?" And you'd be like, Arr. "Yeah, yeah, I'd love to." Instead of the cat who's just like, "Fuck off," yeah, and you're like, "Okay, fine, I'll sit yeah. here and work." You want to play, cat? And the cat's like, "No, I want to. I'm gonna sit here all day. Long. I'm gonna sit here and lick my butt, yep, right? That's what I'm gonna do." And then I'll be like, "Fine, I'll just go get some work done." Yeah. No. Uh, so what turns you on, either creatively or spiritually? What what gets your juices flowing? Uh, I'll tell you, just talking with other creative people about the projects we want to work on and how we'll do it. Um, mm -hmm. I started like my, my shop mate will, uh, showed up early today and just over coffee started talking about dragon con and costumes and ideas. And 45 minutes later, we're like, we should probably shut up and go get to work. <laughs> Cause it, it, I love how that yeah. happens. Just time enters this nebulous space where it doesn't really matter. It's going about five times as fast as you think it, it really is, is, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, so it, so that, that gets me going like nothing else because not only does everyone 
I, I, I've surrounded myself with people who are just really inspiring, not just that they're creative and good at what they do, but people who have taken a risk with their life and decided yeah. to, to walk off the beaten path a little bit. And those types of people are the kind of people who are constantly just mulling over ideas and techniques and stuff. The people who never sleep because yeah. their brain won't stop. Yeah, and I, have a, and I have a notebook next to my bed because I will pour out all of the ideas in my head on paper so that I clear my brain, which lets me go to sleep. Because if I don't do that, I can't fall asleep. And then in the morning, I wake up and I look at all these wonderful ideas I had and realize that they're all crap. And I'm like, I'm glad I didn't see yeah. about that. <laughs> exactly. No, I've had that realization more than a cut. I, oh, that hits me in a spot that's very special. <laughs> and so what other talent, other than the ones you've obviously been gifted with, would you like to have? Hmm. Wow. The stuff that the things that I'm really working hard on right now at learning and getting good at are things like the running the business aspect of being a creative person. Right. That is something that does not come naturally to me. And for most creative type people, it's not. And when I went to school for artwork, they didn't they didn't give me any. They should have. Like, I think it would have been great to take one or two business classes. But that's the thing. I lucked out because I switched over from a pre-law uh, major to a theater yep. major. And my grandmother said, if you're going to do that, you have to get a minor in oh, business. Oh. That is my only way that I'll let you do Your this. Grandma, and so, yeah, she knows what's up. Oh, yeah. She was very, very smart in that aspect. And so now I know how to do a budget for an entire film set. You know, I know how to do all of these amazing things on top of the acting training, the weapons training, the special yeah. effects, makeup, the blah, 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 blah. That's how it sounds like maybe just the business. Maybe aspect. I didn't need to take five art history classes, maybe three art history classes and ah. business <laughs> classes. But that's the thing. Like, like when you go to school and you're 18, you're like, I want to learn how to art. That's done. And then at the end of it, you're like, I can art. And then yeah. you're like, but I can't work. <laughs> but here's the thing. I was able to do the minor in two summer school yeah. sessions. Yeah, see, and, and that's all it would have taken. Yeah, I mean, it really is just that simple. And if you have that kind of foresight, if you're lucky enough to have someone around you who has that kind of foresight, that can make all the difference in yep, the world. Yep, yep. That, and that's what I, when people ask me, youngsters will say, hey, I want to do prop making for a living. And I'll say, well, A, you can go try and work in Hollywood, and that's really, really hard, but you have to move to L.A. and try and get into Hollywood. And Or if you want to do it the way I'm doing it and you're still in school right now, take every business class they have. Learn how to market, learn how to sell, learn how to sell yourself. Cause that really segues nicely into the next question quickly. What advice would you give to your 13-year-old self? 13-year-old uh, me, well... There are a list of ex-girlfriends I would tell him not to date. That was just a massive wig. <laughs> um, but I don't know. 13 is a little... I think here's the problem. I'll tell you what the problem with this is. If it was 23-year-old me even, the uh, which was roughly 10 years ago for me, the advice that 23-year-old Bill got back then was really, really great advice from really, really, really smart people, and I didn't follow any of it. <laughs> I didn't. I had to live through it for it to make any sense. Of course you yeah. did. I mean, that is that is the circle of unfortunately the circle. Of yeah. Life. So, but I would I would definitely tell him a list of girlfriends not to date. That's probably. I would tell him just to like I met. And then listen to that advice that twenty three year old you guys. Yeah. Get. Um. I I met my wife when I was a freshman in college, and we didn't still start dating until after college. Just yeah. tell him, just stick with her. Just just start dating her and just stick with her. And then you'll save yourself a whole mess of trouble. <laughs> There's no need to plow through that entire patty of psycho pain. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We've all been there. That's what college is yep. for. Uh, so what is something that only you do? Mm. That's, that is a tricky one. See, the problem is that I do have an identical twin brother, and we do – Oh yeah. Early. So I Yeah, that does kind of ruin the question a little bit. The challenge of of that. Uh I don't know. That's tough. I'll even say things like I was in a real big fish cover band, which is kind of <laughs> But my friend Harrison uh, from Vulpin Props was also in a real big fish cover band. So I was like, "Oh, that's not that unique." But uh 
I own and operate punished props. I'm the only person here doing that. <laughs> Fair enough. No, that is that that is definitely something to pin on your G Wiz book. I would I would be proud of that, sir. What is your favorite curse word? Curse word. I well, I invented some new ones the other day. I was, I was ordering. Did, did that blade snap? No, no, no. I, I haven't broke a, a blade in a while. But no, I was the this house. I rent this house, and the power management is terrible. So uh -huh. my computer, all of this here, plus all the lights, plus most of my power tools in the shop are all on the same 15 amp breaker. So I had just finished ordering 20 things to ship inputting addresses and all that and i hit pay and uh -huh. the, the breaker tripped so i'm sitting here in darkness and just vomiting oh. curse words uh, oh <laughs> just my stomach just dropped yeah i think just in hearing that story i can only imagine yeah and i think the first one that came out was it was a combination it was oh shit fuck it was the first one that came out uh, followed by a whole bunch of other ones <laughs> Just a string of endless. Yeah, mostly just demonic curses of this house and whoever yeah. put all this crap on that one stupid breaker. <laughs> so where would you one day like to live? That's well, that's a good one to think about. I, I, do, I do love to travel, and I haven't had the opportunity to travel too far outside of the United States in a while. But I used to live in New York, and eight years ago I moved to Seattle, so I got sort of an East Coast and a West Coast flavor. But um, as far as living, I could probably live in San Francisco. I have a lot of friends there. I kind of like it there. Uh, I hear the bay stays nice and cool most of yeah, the time. Yeah, it does. It doesn't get too warm. I don't. I just recently went to Arizona for Phoenix Comic Con, and I have absolutely mm -hmm. no desire to live there. It, <laughs> it, it is actually Tatooine. It's, like, it's getting to yes. that point here uh, in Austin, and so yeah. There are two uh -huh. sons. I saw it. I I will swear in a Bible. I saw two sons. <laughs> So uh, not Phoenix. I will visit again, friends. I have friends in Phoenix, and I will be there again. But let's just go ahead and say San Francisco seems kind of nice. Fair enough. Uh, so last question here. If you had a choice, how long would it take you to respawn after you died? Mm. So I could maybe jump ahead in the future and see a little bit more. The rules are yours to yeah. make. Yeah. I don't know. <sighs> That's the thing. I love seeing innovation in process. Mm -hmm. Like we can, we can look at smartphones now and look at them ten years later, and I really enjoyed how we got to where we are now. So I don't really have an impulse to jump too far in the future. But then again, you could be on just spectator mode for the next five hundred years. That's true. I could observe it. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's tough. I don't want to jump too far and go beyond the singularity. I think I would want to be around for that. How about fun yeah. just before the singularity? There we go. Fair enough. Fair enough. I uh, I think when I was asked a similar question, I said I want to be around for the person who invents the technology that allows us to live in space. Yeah, yeah. live in, indefinitely. Yeah, whatever that may be, oxygen recycling, yeah. uh, you know, creation of new material, whatever that yeah. is, that, that technology I want to be we, there for. You might be around for that. Who knows, you know? But Here's yep, something. and if that that medical tech actually battery technology, let's hope that jumps up in the next couple of years. But Ain't that the right but thing. if the medical technology keeps going, then we may be around for long, much much longer than our predecessors. So we may have a longer period within which to observe those kinds of changes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our Hooray. show. I uh, want to thank my guest. Bill Duran for coming on today. Is there anything you'd like to plug before we get out of here? Sure. I do. Um, I got my punishedprops.com is where all my stuff is. There's links to Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff there. Mm -hmm. I also have my store there where uh, right now, if you use a code uh, summer 2014, any of my digital files, my eBooks, like how to make foam armor, any of the blueprint files that I have, they're all 25% off with that code uh, for the next week or so. So uh, if you're interested in any of that, now is the time to grab it at, uh, PunishProps.com. And then your YouTube channel is just uh, YouTube.com slash PunishProps. That is correct. And then Twitter handle is at ChinBeard. That's been underneath him this whole time. I want to thank you so much for coming on today, Bill. You've been excellent. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, so 
My name is Tim Leftwich. You've been watching this on youtube.com slash Tim Leftwich. You can find the audio version of this and all of the episodes that I've done on soundcloud.com slash Tim Leftwich. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. And as always, we'll see you next time. And now I've been doing it long enough that people are starting to... Uh get into the question asking and like doing goofy stuff so my friend eric started sending would you rather questions like the really goofy hypothetical questions yeah so it's yeah, it's yeah. turning into something a little bit more than i planned it and it's fun and i really look forward would to you it. rather fall into a pit of snakes or be kicked into a room of bees right yeah that, exactly that sort of thing no that was a real oh, yeah, question yeah. Uh, oh boy bees gotta go with bees yeah, yeah. fair enough yeah, you got I, less of a chance. I to... already know that I'm not allergic to bee stings, but I am definitely allergic <laughs> to snake venom. <laughs> That's just a hard fact. You're just hardwired for science. that one.